three, two, one. Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett from Miami, Florida, broadcasting live for Larkin Hospital TV, the neurosurgical channel. Today we have the honor of having Dan Ochiang, MD, a neurosurgeon from Cape Town, Africa. And today uh, Dan is going to present three different, well, possibly three, uh, at least one case, neurosurgical case, in a grand rounds type of format, which is very innovative for the internet. And we have, well, first we'll introduce the guests. And then we'll turn it over to Dan. Why don't we start with you, Eleonora? Hello, everybody. My name is Eleonora, and I'm a final year medical student in Rome, Italy. And I'm interested in neurology, and so I'm looking forward to this presentation. Okay, and uh, Frederick? Uh, hello, my name is Frederick. I'm a student from Belgium, fourth year. Um, first time on the panel now. Um, I'm excited. Uh, super interested in neurosurgery, everything that is to do with uh, nerves, brains, everything. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. Great. Uh, welcome, Frederick and Lisa. Oh, Lisa, you're muted. There you go. Hi, everyone. I'm a second year medical student and in Bentonville, Arkansas, and I attend Oceana University of Medicine. Okay, Richard. Hi, um, Richard Mendel, I'm a neurosurgeon. I, I'm from Tampa, Florida, and um, my practice is really um, common uh, private practice with a big focus on spine, um, but I'm still am interested in things like functional neurosurgery as well. Yeah, and Richard's done a couple of great hangouts the last couple of weeks, teaching hangouts. And Simon? Hi everyone, uh, Simon. Uh, I'm in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, it's always wonderful to be uh, on the panel on these uh, neurosurgery hangouts. I'm a developmental psychologist and a medical student. And welcome, Simon. And Ben. Hi everyone. My name is Ben. Uh, I'm a physician, uh, internal medicine. Uh, I'm from Michigan, and I'm also a health informatics. Um, specialist and uh, I'm very much interested in these hangouts and I've uh, been associated with Dr. Bennett for a while and uh, I'm so excited I'm here. I'm glad well, welcome, to be here. Yeah. Well, well, welcome Ben and I'm John Bennett, an XER doctor in Miami who uh, loves hangouts and loves neurosurgery and we have Dan. Welcome Dan, it's all yours. Hey John, um, as John said my name is Dan, Dan Ocheng. I'm originally from Nairobi, Kenya, but currently based in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. I'm a neurosurgery resident at the Department of Neurosurgery in, uh, at the University of Cape Town. So um, I'm glad to be invited as a speaker today, and I'll just be picking off out from where Richard left last week. And the, last week we had a little bit talk about spine, and, and the focus was a little bit on examination of patients and basically what you'd expect. So my talk today is very basic. It, it starts with a small anatomical review of the spine, just especially for the medical student, because that's the group that I wanted to focus on today. And then after that, um, when it comes to the final case management, then Richard, if you'll allow me, I'll defer to you. It seems like you do a lot of spine. So maybe you can discuss what, maybe make one or two pointers on what um, could have been done for these three patients. So yes, I'll okay. put up my slide and we should be able to start. Okay. So generally, um, I'll start with the spine basics. Um, it's always important to remember that um, the spine is, is composed of the bony vertebra on the outside and the th four main regions, the cervical, the thoracic, the lumbar, and the sacrum, and also the coccyx. Um, generally, the difference is between all of them, but we appreciate that we have seven cervical vertebra, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacrum. And depending on the text you read, generally we agree on about three or four fused uh, coccygeal vertebrae. And then uh, back in your basic anatomy classes, you'll be able to tell the difference between the vertebrae. But the main function of the vertebrae is to maintain that, um, protect the spinal cord, but also help you in maintaining that upright posture. If you tend to look at the um, gross anatomy of the spinal cord, it's important to appreciate that the spinal cord has an anterior part and a posterior part. Mm -hmm. And then on the side, you have the nerve roots that are exiting. Excuse me, Dan, the, yes. the, slide, the slides aren't changing. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. On my side, it's changed. Sorry. Um, 
Okay. I have my second slide going up. Nothing on your side? Oh, you, we see the Cape Town picture still. Oh, oh, sorry. For some reason, I'm able to change them on my side, and I'm wondering why. Sorry about the technical glitch. That's I'm that's able to go through my slides. Okay. Well, I, we, I, try, try, try to click on the slide on the left. Okay, uh, let me try. If I physically yeah. click on it, it moves on my side. Okay. Is it moving for everybody else or no? No. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same. staying the same. Staying the same. Uh, staying the same. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Sorry, guys. No, it's there, there, you there you go. There you go. There you go. So maybe if I put it in full view, then maybe there's a problem. But if I put it in this minimal view, can everyone see the different slides? Yeah. No. Yeah, we can see the different slides, but the picture is fine. Okay, yeah, that's cool. very good. Very good. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Cool. Let me maintain this view then. Maybe that way we'll make sure that everyone is on the same page. Sorry okay. about that. Okay. So back to the gross anatomy. Um, it's, a, it's important to appreciate the spinal cord itself um, extends all the way generally from the area of the foramen magnum all the way to the L1, L2 region in adults. Um, and it has a ventral aspect and a dorsal aspect with the nerves coming off um, from the side. And as you can see, these are the nerve roots that are emerging from the side. Then dorsal nerve roots are generally sensory, while the ventral nerve roots are generally motor. And then they all come out to come through the neural foramina. This is a drawing depicting the anterior aspect of the spinal cord. At the top, appreciate the cross section with the ventral horns generally being larger, especially in the cervical and in the lumbar areas where they, they go to supply the, the, the appendicular um, muscles. At, sorry, they go to supply the hands, the upper and the lower limbs, uh, and therefore that area, the ventral uh, forms are even much larger than they are in the thoracic and in the sacral regions. Appreciate that you have your ventral roots coming out at this point with the dorsal roots at the back, and the dorsal roots have the dorsal root ganglion, and then generally you have them combining to form out the spinal nerve that comes out through the neural foramina. Based on last week's discussion, uh, one of the things um, that really helps you to identify or examine a patient is by your appreciation of what tracts pass through different parts of the cord. It's important to, to remember your ascending and your descending tracts, and the tracts generally are just nerve conduction highways that mediate different sensations. The most important ascending pathways that you, you get a lot in medical school and what really helps you when examining patients, and one of the cases we're going to discuss should be able to integrate this, are your dorsal columns are right at the back, which are the gracile and the cuneate fasciculus, and this generally um, mediate proprioception. Then on the side, you also have one of the larger ascending tracts, which is your spinothalamic system, and your, anterior spinal, your lateral and anterior spinothalamic tracts. The lateral spinothalamic tract is very important in terms of uh, subserving pain and temperature, while the ventral uh, spinothalamic tract generally subserves a uh, fine touch and pressure. So all our sending tracts are, um, in this diagram, um, illustrated on the left side of your hand screen, and the um, descending fibers are generally, in this diagram, on your right hand side of your screen. But in the human anatomy, it's important to appreciate that both ascending and descending tracts are found on either side of the spine. This is just for ease of gra diagrammatic representation. So just uh, important notes, as we've mentioned, appreciate where your spinal cord ends. Appreciate that towards the end, you have what you call the corners, which is the distal aspect of the spinal cord. And that towards that end, you have what we call the cauda equina, which is the different nerves still going on to come out. And it sort of gives you the, what the anatomists describe as the tail of a horse appearance of the cauda equina. And finally, the, termina, the phylum terminale, which is a band of dura that goes to attach this cord and basically anchor it all the way S2. The blood supply of the spinal cord is important. I uh, appreciate that ventrally you have one anterior spinal artery. It generally starts from the two anterior spinals that come from the uh, vertebral artery, but then join in to give you the major spinal artery. Then along the spinal cord, you have reinforcements via the radicular arteries, the largest of which is usually the artery of Adam Kewitz that uh, supplies uh, most of the middle and lower spinal cord. And then appreciate that Originally, in a new in 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 in, in utero, the, the spinal cord extends all the way to the tip, but then because of differential growth of the vertebral bony column, then 
there's relative ascent of the spinal cord, and that's why by the time one is born, then the, it's relatively at the level of L2 and ascends to L1. So I'll finally present um, my first case. And my first case is a gentleman, a 33-year-old male that we saw in our trauma who was uh, an unrestrained passenger in a motor vehicle accident. And the report from the paramedics was that he was ejected from the vehicle. And by the time they got to him, he had poor control of his airway, so he was intubated on scene. A hard collar was applied and then transported to an emergency room. At that time, uh, the paramedics reported him to be paraplegic. Ooh. So when he arrived on our ER room, then um, his GCS, which is our general screening exam at that point, we uh, saw that he was E4, which means his eyes were opening spontaneously. He was able to obey commands, but he was intubated, so we gave him a VT for a total of 10T. At that point, you look at him closely and you see that he can't move his fingers. However, he can extend his wrist. And what I mean by he can't move his fingers is that he cannot adduct or abduct his fingers. But when you ask him to move his shoulders, he's able to abduct his shoulders, he's able to flex his wrists, sorry, flex his elbows, and he's able to extend his wrists. In terms of sensation, he says his sensation is normal on the outer part of his shoulder and the thumb on the lateral aspect of the arm, but reports that he has diminished middle finger absent sensation and also has absent sensation on the inner aspect of the arm and elbow. And finally, when you do an anal tone, uh, there's no anal tone. He does not have perianal sensation, and the bulbocavinous uh, reflex is present. So the reason why um, I thought this would be an interesting case was that generally, as last week we talked, everyone rushes to do imaging. But as we said, it's important to examine the patient and it's important to weed out from the history and try to see what are we able to make out about the patient before we order for targeted or focused imaging. Usually, as we say, that generally by the time you're done with history, by the time you're done with examination, then most of the time you should have a rough idea of what your patient has. So we, from this, we generally can make out the fact that we think that this patient has a spinal cord injury, even though the paramedics told us that he's paraplegic and therefore can't move both legs. Based on the examination, we see that not all of his upper limb is affected. So we need to be able to anatomically describe the dermatomes that are affected. So in terms of sensation, the outer regimental bud area is generally C5. The outer aspect um, of the forearm is C6. The middle finger is C7. The little finger T1, C8, sorry. And then the inner aspect of the arm, T1. Based on this patient, he has absent C7, C8, and T1. And his last normal sensation is around the thumb, so that's C6. So he has a sensory level of C6. In terms of muscle function, then this patient is able to abduct and adduct, so his shoulder movements are fine. He's able to flex his elbow, he's able to extend his wrist, however cannot move the fingers. And therefore, because he's not able to adduct and abduct, it means his um, T1 is affected. So he has a motor level, his last functioning motor level is C8. Then we go to terms of un tone and perianal sensation. Why is it important to tell this? Then we are trying to figure out, is this patient complete? Is this patient incomplete? This patient has reduced anal tone, so we think, and no perianal sensation. So at this point, we think this patient has a complete spinal cord injury. However, he's a few hours um, from the accident. The question is, is this spinal shock? And therefore, you have to check for his cutaneous reflexes. And for this patient, the bulbocavinous reflex is present, which means the cutaneous reflexes have started coming back. And therefore, we don't think this particular patient is um, in spinal shock. So for this particular patient, as I said, we made an impression that uh, the patient has spinal cord injury. The question is the level. We have a motor level of C8, but a sensory level of C6. So you know somewhere in between there, that's where your injury is. And especially for the medical students, this will help you to focus your imaging on the particular level of injury, and therefore you will ask for imaging of your cervical spine. Vis-a-vis, -vis the report that came in initially was that he was paraplegic, and therefore by the time we got there, we found that the, unfortunately, the, the intern in trauma had asked for a lumbar x-ray and a lumbar imaging because this man was paraplegic, but careful examination tells you that this injury could be a little bit higher. As I said earlier, spinal shock is important to consider. It's important to make sure that you are able to assess cutaneous reflexes and when they come back. Again, different authors will describe that 
determination of spinal shock at different levels, but generally at our institution we agree that it's when the cutaneous reflex is coming back. And then from this point we will just now request for imaging to be able to confirm expectations and then make up a plan. I'll show you a bit of the imaging that we got and then from there maybe I'll get opinions from the panel of what you think the injury could have been. Okay. So what I'm showing you are um, cervic bony um, cervical CT scans and uh, these are, are reconstructed formal sagittal formats. One is at the midline and the other one is a bit towards the left just to show you the facets. It's important for the students especially to have a systemic way of looking at your imaging. Generally either start from the outside going in or from the inside going out. So these are the soft tissues, the tongue, um, this is the larynx with the endotracheal tube going through the airway. Appreciate that at this level there is increase in the prevertebral swelling which tells you to look a little bit more carefully around that area. If you look at the bony vertebra then that's your atlas, that's your axis, that's C3, C4, C5, 6, 7, 8 and T1. If you look at the anterior line there's loss of proper cervical um, lordosis. And then if you look at C5, C6, there is a posterior movement of C6 on C5, what we call spondylolisthesis. You can tell from the posterior, when you run a line through the posterior vertebral line, that also that C6 vertebra is displaced posteriorly. And there is impingement of the cord or impingement of the vertebral canal at that point. If you look at this other uh, scan on the side, then we also look at the facets, and you can see this one, the one between three, four, four, five are well aligned, but around five, six, then you can appreciate that dislocation with an associated fracture. So from our imaging, which confirmed what we thought that was a complete spinal cord injury, this patient had by facet dislocation and uh, fracture associated by facet uh, fractures at the level of C5, C6. So Richard, for this kind of patient, what generally would, would your plan be or what would you do for patients who come in with complete spinal injuries uh, and usually with bifacet dislocations? Well, uh, you know, first of all, that was a beautiful presentation and the slides look great. Um, the anatomic slides look great. You know, um, there's a lot involved with this case. There's a lot of parts of this case that are really uh, been controversial for years. Um, you know, th the first thing I I'd point out was that you really described his neurologic status beautifully with that Glasgow Coma Score description. And d do you all understand the Glasgow Coma Score? Eleonora, I'm sure you do. And, and Simon, have, have you seen the Gla Glasgow Coma Score in use yet? Uh, no, I just in, learned it in class but never seen it in use. Yeah, the Glasgow Coma Score is one of the few clinical grading systems that have stood the st test of time. I think this year was the 40th anniversary since uh, Graham and Teasdale described it. And, you know, it, it holds up really well for trauma. Uh, eyes, eyes are 1 to 4, uh, 0 to 4, I'm sorry, eyes are 1 to 4, motors um, 1 to 6, and verbals 1 to 5. And that, you know, that, that's an important thing to know to be able to communicate uh, an exam. The next thing I, I thought that was really important was you, you made the distinction that you had wrist extension. And in a case like this where somebody has a complete injury, the purpose of trying to stabilize them and get back like one level it is often critical. In this person, he's got this injury at the bony 5-6 level but he still has wrist extension intact. If you have wrist extension, you could still function independently in your life. You know, even if you're wheelchair bound, if you have wrist extension, you could dress yourself and you can operate an electric wheelchair. So that's a big deal in somebody like this. Um, the other thing was, you, you mentioned the imaging, and I, I think you're exactly right. You know. When the intern or orders the lumbar series, that's just, you know, that comes with experience. You know, you, you have no spinal cord in your lumbar spine. And this guy's got a spinal cord injury. So you're never really trying to diagnose a spinal cord injury with a lumbar spine study. The lumbar spine study in somebody with this injury, you're trying to establish whether there's 
other fractures elsewhere, like a burst fracture below the spinal cord injury. Um, um, the other thing was uh, that you mentioned was the um, neurologic exam and whether the cutaneous reflexes have come back. And, and, and Dan's right, and that, but that's more advanced. When, you, when you're in the ER, whether you're in neurology, neurosurgery, or podiatry, it doesn't matter. When you have a spinal cord injury patient, you need to focus on blood pressure all the time. You, the last thing you want in a trauma patient is, is hypotension because hypotension can often be confused with neurologic deficits. And when you take a patient to surgery that has spinal shock, you're really worried about um, really labile blood pressure. So if you had to choose one thing, you'd rather have uncontrolled hypertension rather than hypotension in the face of a spinal cord injury. But I, I think the work so far has been great. You got the, the, the either the X-ray or the CT scan. That's critical. You know, you see the jump facet, you, you see the jump facet, and you see the slip. So years ago, it was believed that you could not image somebody. I mean, you couldn't um, um, apply uh, distraction and um, halo halos to get the patient in distraction without getting the MRI first because people would say, oh no, you're going to um, extrude a, a disc into the canal and make them worse. So Alex Vaccaro and the group at the Rothbard Institute did a, a long study and they found that anybody that's not intoxicated could be um, distracted with Mayfield pins or, or a, or a or pongs to um, realign the spine without waiting for the MRI. As long as they were awake and could communicate to you and weren't, you know, drunk or on, you know, had a drug screen that came back high. So one option you have here is to put on Gardner Wells tongs with the patient awake and uh, distracting them into um, um, proper position. Okay. Um, really, that's about it. But you know, I think this is a good learning case. Okay, uh, Dan, do you, any remarks? So, um, um, thanks, Richard. Uh, so that's exactly what we did for this patient. We, uh, for the medical students, again, it's easy to be taken uh, by what injuries the patient um, comes with, and we think it's a spinal injury. But always remember your ABCs of trauma. So it's yeah. always important for us to make sure that we've sorted out the airway, breathing, circulation before we come to now, like in this case, spinal cord injury, which we, we took care of under the D. Uh, the other thing to keep on um, in our mind, this was a high impact injury, an MVA, so we look for associated injuries that this patient are, has. It's important to note and re-examine neurology at intervals, and if this patient, for example, had ascending neurology, then we'd be worried about an epidural hematoma or something, which is something that, that you can acutely do something about. The spinal patients in general, the other things you need to consider would be the risk for developing venous thrombosis, bed sores, ventilator-associated pneumonia, but these are generally long-term. So as Richard rightly said, in terms of acute stabilization for this patient, we were able to put calipers to try relieve the pain, try to reduce the bifacet dislocation, and later on, we did an open reduction in internal fixation to be able to stabilize that level and later be able to help the patient mobilize. So okay. if there are no further comments, um, would I, should I go to the second case or any other uh, addition? Well, well, let's see if the students have any questions. Frederick, Leonora, or Simon, do you guys have any questions? Yes. Oh, ladies first. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead <laughs> Eleanor. Go ahead, Eleanor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the great presentation, then. I have a question because I know that there is another scale uh, beside Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, the ABPU, and I would like to know if you prefer using this kind of scale in the emergency situation or if you prefer the Glasgow Coma Scale because it is a very rapid, a very fast kind of evaluation. 
compared to the Glasgow. And the other question was about the Blue Book Cavernous Reflex and in which way it, it can tell you um, it is not spinal shock. So just these two questions. I, I didn't understand how it can be related to spinal shock or not. So good questions, Eleanor. The first one with regard to the AVPU scale versus the Glasgow Coma scale. So generally, in trauma, we tend to use, or in head injuries, we tend to use the Glasgow Coma scale. And the reason for this, for this is one, it describes more systems than one. And generally, the motor score especially gives you a rough prognostic um, index or suspicion. So generally, for example, if I have a patient with a motor score of M456, then generally that's a patient I expect to have a generally good outcome as opposed to a patient who has M1 um, and M2 in terms of future management and rehabilitation. Um, the other thing about the Glasgow Coma Scale is that um, it, it, it gives you a better standard as well of evaluating more than one system. So yes, you're evaluating the motor, you're evaluating the eyes, and also evaluating the, the, the verbal score. And for patients, who even non-trauma patients who present with, for example, aphasia, then it's easier for you to be able to block up one part of the scale and give them an A, for example, to say they are aphasic, or give them an IC to show that the eyes are closed and they are unable to assess the eyes. So it's, it's generally, I find it a little bit more detailed and easier to focus on. The AVP scale, we use it a lot for patients who generally come from the remote areas and for uh, we have mid-level uh, physicians or mid-level medical practitioners who are not doctors at the clinical officer level. And at that point, they are generally able to tell us whether the patient is either alert, responding to voice, responding to pain, or mm -hmm. unresponsive. In that case, it gives you a general rough idea, but from a head trauma point of view, I usually don't, I'm not able to prognosticate or I'm not able to get a better feel of how the patient is. Anyone else with a different take on the AVPU scale versus the Glasgow Coma scale? Sorry? Anyone else with a different opinion, Richard? Um, no, but I, I do have to say, though, that what you said earlier was really very important. You said two things that were important. One is you're rechecking the neurologic exam. A lot of people forget once you do your initial exam, especially in a trauma patient, like you said, you, you have to recheck these people. You know, the, the, the reflexes can change, you know, in intervals of time tremendously. The neuro exam, you know, is, a, is a, uh, something that needs to be monitored constantly. A one-time neuro exam does you very little good. You need to follow, uh, follow the exam. And I think the other thing you said that was very important was you don't, you're not ordering these tests to find out what's wrong. You should already have, you're, you're like hypothesis testing, and you're just getting these scans to figure out how close you are to being correct. So I think that, you know, that's important too. The, the scans don't tell you what's going on. You know what's going on. You just need to know exactly where and what's causing that problem. That's all. Okay. Simon, Lisa, or Frederick, uh, any, qu any quick questions before we go on to the next case? Yeah. I have a quick question. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ocheng. Uh, it was very, very interesting. I'm learning so much. But I, uh, just a basic question here. Um, you were saying that uh, first there was a consideration that could be a spinal shock, and then you s there were cuta cutaneous reflexes that were coming back, and then you looked at the scan, and you noticed that there was C6 posterior movement. I was wondering. Um, what would happen in the case where you weren't able to have a scan, you weren't able to see an MRI, to what extent would you have confidence that it could be a problem with a C6 or a cervical spine problem if you don't have a scan? So I'd, I'd be fairly confident because the main thing is, as we said, the neurological exam points to a C6 um, a sensory level but a C8 motor level. It's important to remember that even though the bony injury is at C6, then in the cervical, lower cervical spine, the spinal cord is slightly um, higher by about one level. Then when you go to the thoracic spine, then the spinal cord is higher, upper thoracic by about two levels, and the lower thoracic is kind of by about three levels. So there is 
a bony mismatch versus the spinal segment called injury level mismatch. And that's something that a lot of times oh. we, we forget. And therefore, so even without a scan, oh. sorry? I'm sorry, so even without a scan, you can really yes. tell a lot from the, uh, what's the, the Glasgow Coma Scale and the neurological exam. You can really have a... Exactly, and, and, mm -hmm. and if, if you really needed an image, you could be able to do a basic lateral x-ray, and that oh. would just give you a bony confirmation, and that would definitely increase uh, your confidence in, 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 in your you. examination. So wow. you definitely don't, do not need an MRI or a CT scan. Your clinical examination is key. And if you really have to have imaging, especially in terms of trying to reduce the fracture and confirming that your cones, calipers is pulling back your segments, then you can do serial cervical spine lateral x-rays to confirm. Wow, thank you very much. Uh, that, that's, that's exactly right. So what Dan said is important. That remember that the differences in the, the cord being higher in the cervical spine and then thoracic spine. That's all due to what Dan mentioned earlier, the growth of the spine in utero where the, the bony canal grows faster than the spinal cord itself. And that, that's why there's that differential. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, there's, you know, the spinal cord really ends at about your zephyr process. So, um, it, it, it ends much higher than you, you'd probably imagine. But, yeah, that, that's the reason for it. And, honestly, this case to, to, to Dan it's, and a neurosurgery resident, this is somewhat straightforward, but it's very complicated for a medical student you know, to understand all the DVT concerns, the ventilator problems, and an open reduction in internal fixation versus, you know, external um, realignment. Uh, uh, these are things, though, that are, are, are important. It shows you how complicated trauma and spine is. And that's why it's very good, if you're going to do a lot of spine, to spend at least a, a significant part of time with the orthopods that do spine so you get different views. And uh, I learned much better how to do... Um, uh, traction restoration by spending time with an orthopedic service than, than I than I did on the neurosurgery service. Um, but that was a good case. Dr. Chen, I, I got a quick I, question. I got a quick question. <laughs> Doctor, Dr. Chen, I'm Dr. just wondering, Chen, uh, just wondering uh, is there any role of any role steroids in this steroids patient because uh, there was a swelling around that place in like C5, C6. C5, C6. Did you guys use uh, steroids for this patient? Because uh, I think uh, it affects the recovery of this patient. Sorry, Ven. Sorry, I, I didn't know you were. Well. Well. There seems to be an echo on one of the cameras. I know, I know. I know, I'm just I know. One. I'm just one. God. God. Sorry, anyone got the question again? I do. This is Lisa. Hey, Lisa, go hey, ahead. Hey, Lisa, go ahead. Yes, um, I was just wondering how you would talk to this patient or family about the decision for surgery. Uh, I, I do understand the, the surgical, what you're describing, because I'm an RN, uh, but as far as the uh, risks of surgery, outcomes on the nursing care afterwards, long-term care after surgery versus not doing surgery. Um, how would you help the family or this patient decide uh, um, on that option? Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question, Lisa. Uh, so generally, we, we offer surgery for these patients to facilitate um, nursing care and to facilitate uh, rehabilitation, as you say. 
Um, in most cases, or, or largely in all our cases, we would offer them um, open a, re a reduction and internal fixation to stabilize that segment of C5-6, and that would we'd say mainly would help them to be able to help the nursing staff in terms of turning them in the bed, in terms of if they need to hourly turning versus uh, if they need to be mobilized on a wheelchair. And that reduces the chances of them getting DVT, getting bed sores. Um, I'm, I'm yet to come across patients who have declined surgery, um, but generally maybe that's because we strongly push for, 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 for that in terms of nursing care and rehabilitation. I don't know if anyone else does it uh, differently. In terms of Ben's question, yes, thank you. Sorry, I didn't get you the first time about the role of steroids. Um, there have been the very many different studies on steroids, and every couple of years we have one study that predominantly says that the use of steroids is good. Then a few years later, then steroids <laughs> do not work. It depends on what trial is, is in vogue at the moment. For now, at our institution, we generally don't use um, steroids. And uh, one of the things that prompted us to move in that direction was, one, we saw a lot of complications with steroids. And for large, most of the studies that did the steroids trial, they used methylprednisolone, which is generally not the steroid that we use for most of our patients. If you look at us, in our setup, we mainly have betamethasone, and we also have uh, dexamethasone. So we, we really didn't feel comfortable extrapolating the results based on the trial of methylprednisolone. I don't know what the other guys also do. Um, it, as far as steroid protocols, I think you're, you're correct. The 1990 New England Journal of Medicine article that espoused steroids in, in the NASA's, it was, what was it, the NASA's 2 study, that was completely bogus and motivated by corporate interests. None of the primary authors had ever read the entire manuscript. They all thought the other authors read it. Um, the person who did a really great job f sorting all that out was um, Fred Geisler. At that time, Fred was in Chicago at the time. Um, but that study was completely misinterpreted and completely misused. Um, and what happened was that the methylprednisolone, which was generic in the United States, the rest of the world wasn't generic, and uh, that that recommendation that this is what's used in the U.S. generated a tremendous amount of income for the um, pharmaceutical company that owned it. And uh, yeah, there was there's absolutely no um, statistical evidence yet that st that storage really do anything. And the fact of the matter is. There's almost never an instance where something that's been studied for this many years really provides a statistical benefit if it hasn't been found out in the first three decades. We're in about the fourth decade now. So, uh, yeah, I, I can't argue for steroids. And it seems like in every study, the patients that get the steroids have a much higher complication rate. Also, the what happened in the U.S. where there's so many attorneys, everybody was getting suits filed for not using them. It, it became ridiculous, and it started to get to the point where even people who had conus injuries were getting the methylprednisolone, and it's just it, it was ridiculous. It was terrible. Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Richard. We'll move on to the next case. But before we do, I'd like to introduce Carlos Yumagoano, uh from Ecuador and Spain. Hello, Carlos. Unmute and say hello. Can you? Okay. Well, I guess you can't unmute. Anyways, uh, Dan, could you move on to the next case, please? Um, since we have a third case, I'll only do one more case. Um, oh, sure. This is an interesting one. Um, so this um, was generally a 23-year-old male who was involved in a barb roll. Um, he presented to us having been stabbed to the posterior neck. And uh, when he came in to us, he said uh, or reported an inability to move the left side of his body, specifically his left upper limb and his left lower limb. At that time when he came in, the back of the shirt was stained with blood, and the hospital trolley sheet that he lay on was also bloody. 
Um, but the interesting thing about this patient was that even though he had this significant injury on the left, he did not notice or did not realize that he had a nasty bruise on his right torso and also had dislocated his right um, shoulder. It's only when we told him, what about your shoulder? It looks a bit weird that he noticed that, yeah, right, it doesn't feel right. So um, this is the bedding that he was on. Um, any of the medical students care to say what they see? Okay. Go ahead, Simon and Eleonora, Lisa and uh, Frederick. You're on. You mean the color of the blood? Yes. Um, is there anything that's specifically weird about how the blood looks? Yeah. Reason, hello. You guys started out right, Simon. Yeah, there's blood there, but what else is there? There is a halo around. Uh... A halo. <laughs> exactly, Leonora. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, hello. hello, okay. So once, once you see that penumbra or you see that um, sort of ring around the blood, then you're worried about, uh, in this case, for a patient with spinal injury, a spi penetrating spinal injury, injury, you're worried about CSF. So that's mm -hmm. what a typical halo uh, sign would look like if a patient was, was leaking CSF mixed with some blood. So on examination for this patient, he was fully alert. So in terms of GCS, he was 15 out of 15. Uh, the exact wound was on the left side within the posterior area of the posterior triangle and the puncture wound was about two centimeters. There was no enlarging or expanding hematoma and therefore we were not worried about a large vascular injury. Uh, there's no bruit or any added sounds again that would confirm a vascular injury. The other thing that we generally worry about stabs to the neck are aerodigestive tract injury and for this patient he did not have any dysphagia, no hoarseness of his voice so you're not worried about any of the cranial nerves affected, especially the recurrent laryngeal nerve, even though that's more anteriorly between the trachea and the esophagus. And also, you do not have any hematemesis or any hemoptysis, so you do not worry about any upper GI injury. Um, as we said earlier, he had left-sided hemiplegia. And then uh, on further examination, because of the fact that he did not notice that he had a dislocated shoulder on the right, on further inquiry, we discovered that he, did not, he had right-sided loss of pain and temperature sensations on the whole of his right side below the level of the lesion. His anal tone was present and had intact perianal sensation, which told us that this was an um, um, incomplete spinal um, cord injury. So when we have this, generally the thing uh, we worry about, uh, we made an impression of an incomplete spinal cord injury. Because of ipsilateral uh, hemiplegia, that is weakness on the same side of the injury, but contralateral pain and temperature, which is loss of uh, pain and temperature sensation on the opposite side of the injury. This is classically uh, for brown sequard syndrome. Um, the other thing that usually at times can appear to be like this if someone has a vertebral injury and therefore has either stroke affecting one side of the brain. But the reason why this was not, um, or clinically this did not seem to be the case was the fact that his hemianesthesia was on the opposite side and not on the same side of the lesion. So if you have an hemianesthesia on the opposite side as a hemiplegia, then it's more of a spinal cord injury because as you remember your spinal tracts, remember your anterior, sorry, your lateral spinothalamic fibers decussate to the opposite side as they travel um, up to the brainstem. This patient had an active CSF leak, so the other concerns we would have for this patient would be uh, meningitis and the fact that he was stabbed using an unknown implement, the other thing we'd be concerned about would be tetanus. So in terms of imaging for this patient, again imaging in this case is to confirm. And here, um, if you're worried about bony injury, then either a x-ray would suffice or a bony CT scan would suffice. But just for the purpose of uh, this presentation, I'll only show the MRI scan, which was done just to show it from an um, academic or educational point of view. And if you look at the images, then this is an MRI scan. The first image is a T2-weighted MRI scan. You can see the CSF appears white. And this is the spinal cord at the center, and this is the knife track going all the way into the spine. This track at the back is the bag of CSF coming out to leak, and um, the image on your right of the screen just shows the collection of the CSF within uh, the soft tissue. So I Again, it's not something that you see every day, but a brown squad is one of those syndromes that we read about a lot, and I thought it would be an interesting case for 
um, the students also to have a look at. Any other comments from the rest of the panel? That's really an excellent case because, you know, last week I showed you those vascular injuries to the cord and, and you want to you wanna keep them in mind when you're taking, like, board exams and that kind of thing. This is the typical section of the cord where, you know, one, one half the cord is cut right down the middle. So th this is a very good case where you can localize everything to that one region. Thanks, Richard. Any other comments from the rest of the panel? Yeah, he's there, okay. sir. Herniation. Uh, hello, tell me. Please, please, Eleonora. Yeah, is there a sort of herniation of the... No? Is there a sort of herniation so the um, central nervous system is coming down? Uh, um, Sorry, I didn't get your question, Eleanor. Um, anyone? I think, Eleanor, I think you're, you're seeing the... CSF extravagate, extravasate out the stab wound, but it's not it's not a herniation like he's got increased intracranial pressure. Okay. Actually, okay. there's you know right now it's decreased decreased yeah, because right, it's right. it's leaking out. So yeah, sure. he's probably going to develop a bad headache. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. That was a great case. I I think that, uh, for example, if we, we uh, revise about the description uh, of the case, we see that it's an in an, um, incisive uh, injury. And after that, uh, you can see a uh, bleeding of the patient at the CSF leak. And uh, if you look the MRI uh, image, you will be see that uh, there will be another an, an, um, an, um, injury that is uh, communicating the canal with an with external uh, wound. And I think uh, in this case it's about an, uh, an um, uh, um, injury of the spinal cord that they are doing an hemisection. For that, they had the patient had a, a hemisegard uh, uh, syndrome, and after that, uh, they pay, the patient may may have uh, in the parallel uh, state and uh, bleeding and a CSF leak. But I think uh, in this case, it's in a spinal cord hemisection. Thanks. Thanks. Um, hello. Um, any other? How would you generally treat these patients, um, Richard or Ven, if you saw them? Uh, do you conservatively manage them? Do you actively try to stop the CSF leak? What generally would uh, the rest of the panel do? Um, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, if you could get that CSF leak, that fistula stopped, I'm not sure you need to do much else. The question really you, you know, I, I have to review this, but, you know, the the regions of the neck where the stab wound went through, you know, you could gear your level of treatment to that. Obviously, you, you've, already, you, you've already ruled out a lot of the other injuries that can occur with the penetrated wounds to the neck. Um, I think probably with an injury like this, if the patient's neurologically stable and not, not infected at first, it may not be something that needs to be explored right away, and if the if that CSF leak could stop, that would be great. But there there is a chance that's going to need to be treated, and he's going to need uh, antibiotics and and the tetanus. Make sure the tetanus is intact and he doesn't develop a meningitis. Thanks, Richard. That's that's exactly what we did. We decided we opted to manage him conservatively. Um, in two days, the CSF leak uh, stopped on its own, and uh, after that, he was for rehab. Yeah, antibiotics, uh, watch it, and then anti-tetanus prophylaxis. Yep. Yeah. 
Yep. When, when you're not sure what to do, it's better to do nothing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the joke in neurosurgery, that 50% yeah. of our patients get better no matter what we do. So, yeah, <laughs> you watch and see. A no. Any questions from the students? Hey, uh, hello, just hello. A, okay, go ahead, Simon. Go ahead, Simon. Go ahead, Simon. Uh, just another typical med student question. Uh, I, I'm doing rotation in radiology now, and we have some uh, uh, some MRIs come in on the spine, and I can tell you, I, I I hardly can recognize any of it. Um, I'm wondering how long does it take for one to be able to read the MRI? Um, I mean, in the beginning, uh, when someone is a resident, do, would you have to have the radiologist? explain it to you or how long can you develop the skills that you can do it by yourself? Do you, do you guys read a lot of your own MRIs? Yeah, I would uh, never for us, trust anybody. It's, you don't know the radiologist sometimes that's read the study and yeah. I, I'm not saying that I'm great at MRI but I've seen many many thousands of them and, and so I don't. I don't ever trust a report. I, I always look at the MRI. But remember, the MRI. It, it's 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 modern. You know, it. When I was a medical student, we start with cervical spine films. Then we read CT. Then MRI. So I'm pretty confident that I'm not missing a lot. I absolutely defer to the radiologist on shoulders, chest, everything else. But when it comes to the spine and the brain. You know, I, I, I trust yeah. my clinical area. Right. Right. But the radiologists are good at everything, but um, I, I think you're going to find that the neurosurgeons are going to be looking at, at, the, uh, at the problems that he, he sees that are likely to happen. The radiologists often in our country are dictating to prevent lawsuits. So they're, they're, they're looking for signs of zoot zoot gamushi fever and everything else, right. when in fact we're looking for fractures and common things. Right. And it, this, is not a, this is not to disparage the radiologists. I understand why they read so defensively, but um, you, you want to rule out the common things. CYA, cover your ass. Yes. Um, uh, but somebody has to cover the patient's ass too, and so <laughs> you want to cover the patient's ass for what's likely to happen, not for crazy stuff. No, not the right. Uh, how about you, Dan and Carlos? You guys read your own MRIs? So for us, yes, we do read our own MR MRIs, and especially for the residents, we encourage them to make sure you look at the MRI and try to correlate it to what made you order the MRI. The thing about imaging is that you'll always see things that are totally unrelated to what the patient presented with. Exactly. So you always treat the patient and not the MRI itself. So if you know why you ordered it, you're able to look for the specific pathology. That said, we also still, as you said, uh, everyone has to cover their behind. So we usually make sure we, we also look at the radiologist report and make sure it agrees. And whenever you have a difference between your opinion and the radiologist interpretation, then you get back and give them a call and then try to see, uh, find a common way together. But yes, the, the general rule is that every every person has to be able to read their own images. Yep. How about you, Carlos? Do you read your own MRI? Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, in this case, uh, it's important uh, to do an MRI because uh, they will be shown to us uh, on a very Detailed uh, uh, to permit to us an very detailed analysis of the the, the, the injury, and uh, for other uh, side, it's uh, uh, very important to to for to take a uh, decision decision what's about the management of this uh, this patient. I think so. It's uh, in this case it's very important to do an MRI. Okay. Thanks. Okay, Dan. Okay, Dan. Okay, Dan. Um, what would you like to do, Dan? Would you like to continue on to another case? Do you want to save that for another time? Whatever you want to do. We can probably save that for another time. I have one more case of a spinal tumor. The only thing that would be interesting is how the images look like. 
Okay. Uh, but apart from that, unless anyone else has another case, then uh, depends on what you guys prefer. Yeah, yeah, why don't you go ahead and do it real quick. Okay. Okay. So um, let me just show that again. Sorry, okay. guys. Okay. So my last case is actually a sad one. It's an unfortunate one. It's a um, 29-year-old man that I saw recently. A gentleman newly married um, came in complaining of persistent neck pain for the last three months. Um, he described this pain as worse at night, uh, more of the slow burning type, which was not relieved by medications. And uh, over the last uh, several weeks, he was having difficulty in sleeping. He now reported that he had reduced ability to grasp objects um, with his left hand, sorry, with his right hand over the last two weeks. And this was especially over. Uh, accompanied by hyperesthesia over his little finger and the inner aspect of the arm. So based on this, we thought um, it's mainly affecting uh, the CHT1 dermatomes. Uh, he's having trouble problems with grasping, so that's more of the T1, the intrinsic muscles of the, of the hand. The interesting thing is that it's not really a particular radiculopathy, but we'd want to examine and check whether he had upper motor neuron lesion signs or... Um, lower motor neuron sign. So we'd like to examine and check what his reflexes are like. The only other uh, details on the social history was the fact that he was a newly married gentleman, new father, unfortunately and now unable to hold his son, um, and was getting depressed due to that. So generally, he's, a, he's not the typical guy you'd expect to be malingering or trying to get out of going to work. He has a lot going for him, and therefore, it's, it's one of those who, unfortunately, had been over the last three months treated as someone who had uh, psychological issues rather than acute organic causes of his pain. When we examined him, uh, we saw that he had no midline tenderness. He had no gibbous deformity, so we didn't expect, we didn't think of any uh, bony malformations. Um, he had no paraspinal muscle or upper limb atrophy. However, on reflexes, he was hyperreflexic and hypertonic um, in his right upper limbs and uh, he had normal lower limb function. So we thought he basically had an upper motor neuron lesion. The question was, um, what was the cause of this upper motor neuron lesion? So in terms of differentials, we thought this is a patient who has cord pathology. It's mainly affecting C7, 8, and T1. He has no history of trauma. It's an upper motor neuron lesion, as we've said. It's unlikely to be degenerative because he's a 29-year-old man, has not been lifting heavy weights, has not been involved in an MVA before. A tumor is possible, but it's one of those rare things, especially in this age group. And uh, we did not find any obvious infectious etiology or pathology that could explain his symptoms. So it was one of those cases that generally we, we had a list, a long list of differentials. We could rule out most of them, but unfortunately we didn't have a clinching diagnosis. So um, we did an MRI, and unfortunately that's what the MRI showed. So on the MRI, these are, the one on the left is a T2-weighted MRI, and the main thing that you, can, you realize is that we have an intrinsic spinal cord lesion, well delineated, extending all the way from the region of C4 to just below C6. Um, there's no lifting of the dura, so that tells you that the cord, it's an intrinsic lesion and it's expanding the cord. And above it, there seems to be some signal changes consistent with some edema of the spinal cord. Um, the, when you see this kind of lesion, T2 MRIs are very good in showing you pathology, but then we usually want to check what kind of lesion it is based on what contrast uh, pattern uptake it's like. And therefore, we did a T1-weighted MRI with contrast uptake. Yeah. And therefore, you see a ring-enhancing lesion of the upper cervical spine with uh, hypo-intense areas at the center. So the hypo-intense areas at the center generally tell us we think this is a, um, either something that is degenerative at the center. The fact that it takes contrast tells you there's a degree of inflammation or there's a degree of breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. And we thought this was a patient who had an intrinsic um, glioma lesion, most likely high grade. And in this case, we are thinking either grade 3 glioma or a GBM. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately for this chap, uh, we thought it was a highly malignant lesion, but we could not get the confirmation unless we did some histological uh, diagnosis. 
So just for the students, for whenever, not necessarily in the spinal cord, but whenever we have ring-enhancing lesions, especially uh, within the brain, then there are different mnemonics that you can use. But generally, the one that we commonly use is Magic Doctor or Magic DR. And the things you're worried about is either a metastasis or an abscess or a glioma or post-irradiation or uh, patients with demyelinating disease, or at times even um, uh, post-radiation necrosis. So we took this patient for um, under, under electrophysiologic monitoring, we tried to resect the tumor, and frozen section for this patient unfortunately came back positive for a glioblastoma multiforme, which is um, unfortunately very poor prognosis, and he's been scheduled for further radiotherapy just for palliative uh, radiotherapy. Any other comments from the audience? That, that's a devastating, just a devastating tumor. Um, we, we've made no progress with glioblastomas really significantly in the last 50 years. The death rate still 99.9 .9, uh, in terms of mortality. So, so just supportive therapy for... The only good thing about a glioblastoma is that it's not painful and you're not alive very long. Right, right, okay. It's better than a grade three. That's not painful, but you can linger for a long time. Sad, it's very sad. Okay, but it's very rare in the spinal cord, correct? In adults, in yeah. adults, it's fairly rare, but, it, you know, it's in, in Children, it's much more common. You know, it's kind of an inverse ratio. You know, peds, spinal cord tumors are not all that rare, and in adults, uh, spinal cord tumors are, are more rare. But GBM is the most common primary brain tumor, unfortunately. Can you comment, uh, Dan, on you said the difference between those MRIs as far as delineating the, the, the lesion? You mentioned a couple of different types of MRIs. Do you want? Yeah. To um, let me go back to the to the image again. Um, so generally, for 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 the students again, when we look at MRI, we use the term intensity as opposed to CT scan, where we use densities. And um, the reference um, image is that of the brain or the spinal cord itself. So anything that has the same appearance of the cord is said to be iso-intense. Anything that is brighter than the cord would be hyper-intense, and anything is that is less bright than the cord is hypo-intense. So the general reference is here, if we use this white uh, material around surrounding the cord, that's your CSF, and generally your CSF will appear bright, so your CSF is hyper-intense. The other thing that's generally hyper-intense on your MRIs would be fat, unless it's a fat sup suppression sequence. So the fat also in this patient appears white. The other things that would also appear, that would be areas of increased edema on a T2 scan, then that would also appear hyper-intense. So this is generally a T2 scan, and the way you, you get used to it with time, but the way you cheat when you start uh, looking at MRI scans is by looking for the CSF. And if you see the CSF is white, then generally that would be a T2-weighted MRI. But if you see the CSF is dark, as in the second scan on your right, then that would be a T1 um, weighted scan. As I said earlier, the T2 scan is mainly good for edema and pathology. It shows pathology very well. However, the T1 scan is very good for anatomic delineation of structures. The way we modify the T1 scan is to by giving contrast. And in this case, we usually use gadolinium. And the gadolinium will usually enhance, especially if you have a highly malignant tumor or areas where you have the blood vein barrier having been affected, and that will usually light up. So any aggressive tumor, they produce a lot of uh, vasogenic factors, factors that encourage uh, vessel proliferation, and therefore usually you have a lot of contrast uptakes in the margins. So for this tumor here, you can see around the tumor margin is that it's very well delineated and you can see the boundary of the tumor telling you it's something that either is affecting the blood brain barrier or there's some degree of inflammation. And, mm -hmm. and the things, as I said, that generally would give you that ring-enhancing pattern type. This is not your typical ring-enhancing, but in the brain, if you had 
a ring enhancing lesion then either you'd be worried about a metastasis you'd be worried about an abscess you'd be worried about a glioma you'd be worried about um, um, infections or uh, radiation you'd be also worried about uh, demyelinating illness in some types of demyelinating um, MS for example at times can give you a, a, a ring enhancing though not very common and then radiation necrosis can also give you something like that. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Dan. John, John just, so you, just so you know, John, what Dan explained to you is kind of like the matrix of how you make decisions based on what you're seeing, but the T1 and the T2 are going to come with every MRI you order. Okay. So what Dan probably ordered was an MRI of the cervical spine with and without contrast. So that gives you T1 and T2 without contrast and T1 and T2 with contrast and then you can you know make your decisions. So it's not like he had to order a T1 and a T2. They'd come in the sequence. Okay. You know? Okay, very good. Uh, students, any questions? Hello Wendy, welcome. Am I, am I blocking you out? Let me get. Let me get your. Uh, oh no, no, it's me. I am. Oh, okay. uh, I'm. Uh, went to the nearest uh, internet from um, the hospital so I could listen in. Thank you so the much for presenting the cases. I appreciate it. Dedicate dedication. Welcome, Wendy. We want to hear from Frederick. Frederick, Sorry. how are you? How are you doing over there? You're very quiet today. Yeah, yeah. I was just um, getting to know it. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, I was just wondering, um, would there be uh, an option for um, chemo in this case? Um, that would be yeah. the number one treatment, right? Well, Dan, what do you think? <laughs> Unfortunately, not. Not uh, we. We don't find a a good role for chemotherapy for for GBMs. Um, okay. as, as as Richard said, it's it's unfortunately when we see them, the diagnosis is terminal. For this patient, especially this tumor is in the C five six seven region. You can already see tumor edema ascending up and below. Remember, you have um, cervical uh, three, four, five. Then supply the phrenic nerve that control breathing, and therefore for this patient soon, he'll start having difficulty with uh, breathing. And even with the radiation that we sent him for, the problem with radiation is there's a lot of swelling post radiation, and uh, for the radiation that generally at times even makes them worse. So for a lot of these patients, unfortunately, the prescription we offer them is to to go back to family, make, uh, mm -hmm. give them pain medication, and try. I palliate them over the next few days. So we, we don't aggressively chase after chemotherapy and radiation for GBM patients, unfortunately. Okay. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, you, Dan, and thank uh, Richard uh, for coming uh, and, and all the other panelists for coming. Uh, hang around after. I'm just going to end this official broadcast of Larkin Medical TV, the neurosurgical channel. Uh, good evening, world.